Watch this. Gas-efficient cars are great for the environment, but they aren't doing enough, apparently, to pay for Idaho's roads. A lawmaker has an idea, and it has to do with a slice of sales tax. President Trump escapes impeachment, and Idaho senators explain their vote of not guilty. Kind of want to find out what's going on with it. A question about a bridge that seemed to be going nowhere. Well, it's five o'clock. By the time the traffic starts piling up in almost every direction across the valley, it's also about the time when the complaints about said traffic start piling up and maybe the fists start flying into the steering wheel. Well, Representative Joe Palmer of Meridian may not be able to help you with your anger management issues, but he does think his House Bill 325 could help relieve the bumper to bumper commutes on state roads across Idaho. And if passed, it would send more state tax dollars specifically to ease traffic congestion across the state. Some legislators, though, argue it's not the way to do that. Joe Paris explains. It's constant. We're always trying to get more money for transportation. We have constant growth going on all the time. It's that thought that gave Representative Joe Palmer this idea. Distribute 1% more of the state sales tax revenue to transportation. Currently, the sales tax distribution formula already has one portion of it that goes to transportation and that's 18 million and all we're doing is doubling that amount. It doesn't change any of the tax, it's just how it's distributed. While other ideas to fund transportation have worked in the past, Palmer says some of those have run their course. The problem is we rely so much on the gas tax and cars get better mileage, so the gas tax continues to deplete. It's not keeping up with the growth, so we had to do another funding mechanism. House Bill 325 would move that extra 1% from the general fund over to transportation. Specifically, it would be used by the Idaho Transportation Department for traffic mitigation. Not everyone agrees, though, that this is the right solution. The sales tax was supposed to go to education. That's what was supposed to happen. And instead, uh, it keeps getting um, uh, diverted to uh, other uses. Representative John Gannon agrees that something needs to be done about transportation funding, but this, he says, is not the way. He suggests looking at the legislative services booklet for some insight. And it shows the very, very significant amount of money that's gone to roads while education has lagged, especially K-12 in our rural areas. Palmer, meanwhile, says if you've ever sat and had to wait in traffic, maybe on a snowy day like this one, this is how his bill affects you. Well, if they're sitting still, then it's definitely going to help them if they're stuck in gridlock. I mean, if you're on a road that's too narrow for the traffic and they can widen that road out and move that traffic faster. This is certainly not an envious position for our legislators to figure out, OK, I know schools need money, roads need money, infrastructure is dwindling. How do they go about solving this then? I mean, it's not a new tax, right? Correct. It's not a new tax. And sometimes legislators, they have to get creative. They have to come up with different ideas. And this is one that Joe Palmer really liked. Again, this is not a new tax. It's just taking the tax revenue that's already there and it's putting it in a different spot, just 1% of it. And Representative Palmer actually told me this morning that each year, the state usually sees about $100 million more than the previous year on those sales tax revenues. So he argues that this really isn't taking money from anywhere. It's just sending it somewhere else. Again, though, Representative Gannon against it, saying that money needs to be going to education. And a lot of people at the state house already say it's underfunded. Yeah, because it would be taking money, then more money away from schools. So that would have to come from somewhere else. That's right. A lot of the general fund goes towards education. So the argument is, yes, we're getting more money every year, but where should it go? All right, sales tax, gas tax, property tax. All the taxes. All the taxes. All right, thank you, Joe. Stand your ground, unless it's snowing. Then by all means, move that ground inside. About 200 Second Amendment activists line the state house halls this morning, some openly carrying long guns in support of Representative Christy Zitto's constitutional carry bill. That bill would change the wording of the current law to allow people not from Idaho to carry concealed handguns within city limits across the state. A bill currently standing its ground in committee. Eye problems. Do you see an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? Well, a bill that may blur the lines a bit between the two has passed the House. We've talked about this before, and this bill would expand the scope of what work optometrists are allowed to do in Idaho. An optometrist is an eye doctor that examines, diagnoses, and treats eyes. They're not medical doctors, but instead have specialized training. 
an ophthalmologist is a medical doctor that does medical and surgical care for eye conditions. It's had a lot of our viewers fired up, but again, it has passed the House, now heads to the Senate for debate, and we will see and watch what they do with it. Word spread quickly last night, Boise City Council passing a hands-free ordinance during their meeting last night, but that's not all there is to it. It did pass unanimously by Boise City Council. However, it still needs to go through the reading calendar and be read at least three times before it can go into effect. So the city is one step closer to banning the use of cell phones and other handheld devices while driving, but there are still several steps left to take. The proposed Boise ordinance would apply even if you're stopped at a traffic light, but does not include exceptions for when you're calling about an emergency. At the end of the day, we have a political exercise, and that political exercise is going to fail. Ms. Rosen, and it did, guilty. with President Donald this Trump being acquitted in his Senate trial by a vote of 52 to 48 when it came to the abuse of power charge and a vote of 53-47 on obstruction. That one vote of difference between the two votes, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who found Trump guilty of abuse of power, but not of obstruction. Idaho Senators Risch and Crapo, not guilty on both counts. Senator Risch explaining his vote, saying, based on his extensive trial background, he didn't think the House managers put together a proper case. They put the case together by taking every fact that they wanted to uh, make fly and put it only in the best light without showing uh, the other side, but more importantly, more importantly, intentionally excluding evidence. We also spoke with Senator Mike Crapo after the vote today over the phone. He didn't go so far to say the president did nothing wrong, it's just that the president didn't go far enough to get impeached. Uh, in any kind of circumstance like this, uh, where there was inappropriate conduct or conduct that was uh, questionable, uh, I don't think that that is something that is, you know, something that should be condoned. But it doesn't mean that it rises to the level of impeachment. We asked Crapo if things would go back to normal in Washington. The senator said yes, but it's a normal of bad feelings, intense partisanship, and heightened battles of obstruction. We'll let you know when that changes. She ripped up the president's speech right after he finished reading it. But was it a criminal act? What's with this bridge built out in the middle of Ada County? Where was it going? And when was it put there? We try to answer a viewer question. Do you have a question you're just itching to ask us? Or maybe you're just curious about something and looking for some answers. Maybe you have a comment about today's show. We want to hear from you. Send us a text, that number on your screen, 208-321-5614.
you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Did you miss it last night? House Speaker Nancy Pelosi right there tearing up President Trump's speech as the president ended his State of the Union address last night. Got a lot of people fired up on social media, including Tina, who posted this question to our 208 Facebook group. She asked, is the written form of the president's speech considered a federal document? If so, then did Pelosi commit a federal crime by ripping it up? All right, well, let's go back to just before the president began his speech, after he was introduced and walked to the podium. He handed a copy of his speech in a folder to both Vice President Mike Pence and House Speaker Pelosi, as is common for the State of the Union. So short answer is no, it wasn't technically a federal document. It was a copy of one. We found this in the Presidential and Federal Records Act amendments of 2014. And according to that document, duplicate copies of records preserved only for convenience are not considered federal record. Examples of non-record materials include copies of information that, quote, are kept only for reference, which is what Speaker Pelosi was doing last night, if you watched her following along for reference, turning page after page. So, no. Speaker Pelosi not facing federal charges for ripping up a copy of the president's speech last night, but she is facing a lot of people calling her actions a performance unbecoming and childish. Wintry weather across the gym state today and waking up to snow right in our backyards here in the Treasure Valley. We told you it was coming and it slowed the commute down this morning. It's also slowing the commute down this evening, but it's turning more to water and uh, wet weather rather than white weather. You check out our current temperature is still fairly close to the freezing mark, but eventually nudging in that milder air and changing it over to rain. I've seen several reports now that we've seen changeover in the Caldwell area. We've seen it in Eagle, Eagle as well as Meridian and even uh, uh, getting a lull in some places so you see this hole in the precipitation right here that's showing up on our radar imagery. It is possible that into the overnight hours as we look down into the lower end of the Treasure Valley, we could see some isolated isolated patches of ice. Freezing rain is a possibility as cold air is really dense and it wants to tend to hang on to the surface and not kick out as that milder air moves in. Also, winter weather advisory is still in effect through the upper Weezer River Basin for slick driving conditions until 11 p.m. tonight and the winter weather advisory also up through the west central mountains that's posted until 11 a.m. tomorrow for more snow that's moving into our mountain locations but that snow level is rising we take a look at i-184 right now traffic is building still seeing a few snowflakes but it's a rain mixed with snow bit of a snizzle right now and that will eventually change over to all rain for us because look at where that mild air is not too far off we're seeing some green shading showing up here Washington, Oregon bend at 48 degrees. That's where we'll be as we get into tomorrow afternoon. So here's future cast. Scattered snow showers continue in our mountain locations, mainly focused on the Boise Mountains as well as up through the West Central Mountains. We change over to rain showers, warm the temperatures up to mid to upper 30s by 5 a.m. tomorrow, already 40 degrees by 9, 10 a.m. And we keep on going to near 50 degrees for our highs tomorrow afternoon. I do think that Thursday is a mainly dry day, but we can't rule out the chance for perhaps a spot shower to make its way through, but it will be drier to uh, much more of an extent than today was. Taking a look at our temperature trend through this week, we only warm up briefly, but that is still about 10 degrees above normal for this time of year. Taking it back down to seasonable temperatures as we enter into next week, and then the cold gets colder by the middle of next week. Here's the bigger picture for us as we head through the end of the week and into the weekend. Again, Thursday, even Friday, mainly dry days, 20 to a 30% chance of a spot shower. Next round of precip moves in on Saturday with another cold front that brings us back to normal. And this is taking a look at next week. I wanted to show you these colors because I think these really show the story of how the cold is going to be draining in for us. Tuesday's when the cold front passes through. Wednesday, into the Valentine's Day holiday and into next weekend, it will certainly feel like winter. Here's a look at the seven day forecast as always for a closer look at the seven day forecast and even a web forecast and interactive radar you can always visit ktvb.com what's with this bridge built out in the middle of ada county where was it going and when was it put there we try to answer a viewer question and we've got something that will restore your faith in humanity from the hardwood of a junior high school gym
I gotta say, we love it when you are part of the 208. And we got a text a couple of weeks ago from a viewer with a question. Chris Brodicker sent in this picture right here. It's of a stone structure that he found near his home, and he included a caption, like to know a little history on this bridge at the end of South Curtis Road. Pretty cool looking bridge. So we looked into it, and we went out to check it out for ourselves. It took us a little time, though, to dig up the story. We were able to put together the pieces with a little help from Treasure Valley history buffs. About three years ago, Chris Brodeker went for a drive south of his house in Southern Ada County when he and his roommate saw something in the distance. We were out here driving around, coming back from the river and come across, headed back home. My roommate said, that looks like a bridge over there. A bridge it was, but to where? I think it was a bridge to get across the old Indian Creek to get to the tracks. The first thing Chris noticed was its unique construction, an arch bridge built with basalt or lava rock and likely collected from the area right around here. Whoever made it did a good job. So I think it's held for quite a few years. How long was just one of the questions Chris had for us? Who built it, why, and when? Well, my guess is at least 100 years. The why was obvious. You can see it crosses a culvert of some kind, likely where the old Indian Creek wove its way across Ada County. But I can't imagine just a farmer doing this much work to get to a field. As for the who and the when, we went to social media and we received several theories. Was it part of a stagecoach road between Boise and Silver City, which was in its heyday during the 1880s? Or maybe a section of service road used to bring materials to build Swan Falls Dam, completed in 1901. All good starting points, but it was a post about a picture in a book called Patterns of the Past, the Ada County Historic Site Inventory that narrowed our focus and put the timeline a little later. Site number 402 describes a basalt masonry bridge that crosses Indian Creek built in the art style popular in the 1910s. Goes on to say, plans for arch bridges built of native stone were usually intended for national forest or national park highways during the 1920s and 30s. This one, they pegged being put together around 1920 and designed by the Department of Interior. <laughs> so Chris guessed about right. And sometimes, out here, you can stumble across a century-old story. A lot of history. There is a lot of history out there. And there's also another bridge out there, just like that one. It's about a mile east. But it's also worth pointing out, both of those bridges are on private property. So it's not like you can just wander out there and check them out. That's kind of what's kept them in such pristine condition, I guess. But if you are wandering around somewhere, anywhere, and find something interesting, maybe you have questions about it, ask us about it. We're going to try to get to the bottom of it, and I'll show you how you can do that right after we show you this. Introducing a new segment of our show called What's Your Sign? Well, this one was spotted in southern Ada County on, you guessed it, private property. It's a play on the private property postings you usually see. A hand-painted sign on slats of weathered wood it reads, private sign, do not read. I'm guessing it means if you made it this far, you likely couldn't or didn't read the property, private property signs you pushed right on past earlier. So why bother reading this one? It's also a testament to the do-it-yourself and kind of the comedic approach of those who live outside our city limits. 
Have you seen a sign that made you laugh or maybe even upset or just wondered what it meant? Send us a picture of it and tell us where you found it. Maybe there's a story that goes along with it. Send us that too. You can find us on email, the 208 at ktvb.com. Join our Facebook group. You can post it there. You can find us and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the 208 KTVB. Use the hashtag the 208 or you can text it to us. Again, that number 208-321-5614. And again, include your name and the hashtag the 208. And again, we love when you are part of the show. We try to get to those at the end of the show. Kind of get to some of those too as we get through the rest of the program. Stay with us. It is only Wednesday, still two days shy of Friday, but we couldn't hold this feel good moment for another two days. Check this out. This happened during yesterday's seventh grade boys basketball game between River Glen Junior High and West Junior High. A moment of joy and amazing sportsmanship. Bradley, see him right there, checking into the game. And within a few seconds, he scored a basket for the Grizzlies. Mark Lannon, the athletic director at River Glen, says Bradley has special needs. Lannon says Bradley loves sports and was having trouble fitting in at school. A lot of us did at some point in junior high, Bradley. But Bradley was braver than most of us in that situation. And he joined both the football team and the basketball team. And this year, he's gotten to play for a few minutes in every home game. Landon says opposing teams and coaches are always accommodating. And as you can imagine, Bradley's confidence has grown. And he's fitting in just fine, thank you. And thank you to the coaches and players and parents that have helped him do that. And a big congratulations to all of our local athletes signing their national letters of intent today. We got kids headed to LSU, Oregon, Boise State, Louisville, Idaho, Washington, Utah, and of course dozens of other schools across the country. So many, it's hard for us to keep up with them, but you can keep up with them. 
You can find all of those at KTVB.com and you can see that entire list on our website. We're going to be right back with some of your comments about today's show. All right, wrapping up the 208 with some of the comments you sent in during the show, and we got this one. Uh, Senator Crapo and Brian misspoke when they said the president wasn't impeached. He was impeached by the House and acquitted of the charges by the Senate. That is correct. What I was saying was paraphrasing what Crapo was saying, that it didn't rise to the level of impeachment, which is why he voted to acquit in that trial in the Senate. So it's kind of semantics there, but yes, we understand he was impeached but he was acquitted in the Senate. Any truth to this story? Nancy Pelosi fined $40,000 for destruction of government property. No truth to that whatsoever. I know it's been floating around on social media today. We addressed it and no, she had a copy of the president's speech and uh, not an actual federal document. In regard to this as well, Trump refusing to shake the Speaker of the House's hand. We all saw that kind of as the speech was getting going. She's third in line to the Oval Office. I agree with her tearing it up. A lot of people do not, thought it was childish. A lot of people said it was just heat of the moment and her reaction to the president. And of course, it kind of speaks a lot to the bipartisanship that's going on right now in Washington. And we'll see, as Crapo said, if it gets back to normal, normal right now, well, unfortunately, is that bipartisanship. Love the story about the bridge. Love and history. That's from Kathy in Boise. It is a great, great story. It's kind of fun to find these little hidden gems that are out there. And if you do find one, let us know about it because we want to know about it too. But the bridge, it's been there for about 100 years and it looks like it's going to be there for 100 more. It is very well built. This one, Debbie Swain. Not a bad way to end the day, right? Hate your show so much. I hate to watch you. Thanks for watching, Debbie. I really appreciate it. As for all the others, we will be back tomorrow to do it all over again. Hope you stick with us, Debbie. We'll see you then.